yeah, I guess we're ready to start. It's 11, 11 p.m. my time, and this event is called Swift UI and how to tame it. And let's get some formalities out of the way quickly. I'm Max, I'm senior iOS engineer. I have more than six years of experience, primarily in iOS. I'm currently working in a Mexican fintech startup, and we are using exclusively Swift UI, but I also have experience with UI kit. And uh, this session is primarily for iOS engineers, at least with some knowledge of Swift UI, or at least awareness of its existence, but also for developers from different backgrounds, looking for some career change maybe. And to the plan for our session, section one would cover a brief intro to the Swift UI and how it's different from the previous Apple framework UI kits. Section, uh, section two would cover common issues and workarounds uh, we encounter Swift UI. And uh, the third section would be a live coding block uh, where I would implement a Spotify loader automation. And we also would have time for questions. So let's start with section one. Swift UI is basically a latest Apple framework for building apps, not only mobile, but desktop as well. And for whatever iOS they have, watchOS. Uh, Mac OS, so yeah, whatever, uh, whatever they have, uh, Swift UI is capable of building apps. It's fairly easy to use for basic scenarios and it has declarative syntax. And that might be familiar for, for some folks from React world, for, from the front end world. And I mentioned uh, this declarative thing and let's be on the same page with that. Uh, in UI kit, as you might remember, we have uh, mostly imperative paradigm uh, where you have a lot of control of what's going on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Swift UI has more declarative paradigm and we have less control of what's happening, but uh, mostly we have a mix of both. We can just uh, declare something and let the system decide for us. And typical Swift UI code looks like this. Uh, it looks like HTML to me. Uh, sometimes we have here a navigation view with navigation bar, we have a list of some items, and Swift UI decides on how to display all of that for us. We also have a navigation link, which will lead us to the second screen but uh, that would be the classic Swift UI code for most of the time. To the power of Swift UI, uh, first and foremost, it's usually less code than in UI kit. In UI kit, uh, to the left, you had uh, to set up a table view. It's kind of a minimal setup for table view to the left, and uh, the same setup in Swift UI to the right, and you can see that there are three times less lines of code in Swift UI. Well, that's cool. Also, Swift UI has a lot of tools and materials uh, coming with it. Uh, you could learn it fast. And you could use live previews to watch uh, how your code changes on the fly without a need to build the app each time. And um, Apple did a fantastic job this time with their documentation. And they now have uh, interactive tutorials that you can check out if you didn't. That's cool. And all these uh, links would be available after the session, of course. And we could have ended up here, but uh, there's a catch. Uh, to more section in this talk, so we're staying. And uh, we're staying to explore some weaknesses of Swift UI. Might get specific here, uh, but I'll try to keep this high level so you're not confused. My top uh, three Swift UI issues would be party previews, uh, live previews that we talked about. And uh, it's pretty hard to control animations in a way that you want them to run. Uh, it's, it's very hard to show a view above everything. And we have to restrain to go like it in this uh, particular scenario. So let's start with party previews. Previews is this uh, little section in the Xcode, and uh, you could 
write some C three I code, and uh, without building the app, uh, you could use this preview provider, and uh, it will usually uh, load your code on the fly. But that's not always the case. Uh, it's uh, getting better each Xcode release, but not quite. It frequently crashes. It's just not working sometimes. And I personally like how this huge lock is called human readable error. Uh, solutions to that uh, would be some obvious one. Don't use previews. Use the old way of simulator or real device. Uh, the second obvious one would be to check your error logs carefully because they're usually helpful. And the uh, third one would be the usual Xcode dance, clean project, uh, relaunch Xcode, or create a project again. But there are one less obvious one. And if you are in a modular architecture and uh, if you are in a static framework that's linked statically, you should change linking style to dynamic because previews are not supporting that yet. And there's a separate thread on developer Apple forums, which covers that issue. The second issue of mine is that it's kind of hard to control animations in SwiftUI. We have this basic scenario. Usually, we want to play one animation, and then subsequently, the other one. We want to change the opacity of an example text, and only then change the offset. And it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard to sprites out of the box. Uh, it's just not there. So solution to that would be write your own completion block for animation. We have this text. We implement the opacity modifier. Then we implement offset modifier. And uh, when we change the opacity, only when animation completed, we change the offset. And all magic is covered inside the own animation completed block. Uh, this is a full kind of implementation of the method. Seems like a lot of code, but uh, it really isn't. All magic is here because this animatable data property holds the old value right up until the moment when we reach our target value. So we could write something like this and check if our animatable data equals to target value and only then call the completion and it will be called uh, in our needed time. That's not my code, uh, to be honest. Uh, and it's credit, credit goes to Antoine Van der Lee. You could check uh, his Swift Lee blog, and uh, this call is also available at the session repo. Uh, to the third one, to the third issue, it's hard to show a view above everything. Imagine a scenario when you want to show a notification bubble or just, I don't know, notification. Uh, you see how it looks, uh, how, how it's above everything. And uh, it's a usual scenario. Uh, for example, no internet connection bubble would be great to have above everything. And uh, what we get in SwiftUI with uh, out of the box behavior, we just can't do that because if we are using modifiers uh, and uh, we are using Windows uh, of SwiftUI, our sheet modifier that presents a sheet, it will cover our notification. Uh, to illustrate that, I firstly, I got the idea that I could rearrange our modifiers and if you worked with modifiers before, you probably expect to modifier work below uh, the area it was applied to the subviews. So first I tried to move the notification modifier to the upper level of our app. And uh, it's just not working. We show the notification and then we show sheet and it's covered, uh, our notification is covered. So the solution to this one would be to unfortunately, for now, bridge to UIKit windows. And uh, with that magical window view, we could achieve just like what we want. 
we show the alerts, then we show feed, and uh, it's working as expected. This magical window view is just bridging our Swift UI views to the scene delegate of our UI kit uh, common app. We have to create separate files if we created a Swift UI app before, and we need to make this. Uh, we need we, we need to pass our object to the view from the environment. That's a whole separate topic. We'll not cover that for now. And uh, when the view appears, we need to add the new window. And uh, this scene delegate that you might be familiar with, it's uh, kind of an entity of the apps startup. Um, now, here we have a window scene that's available after iOS 13, but you can do this to, through the app delegates, uh, not the same delegate, doesn't really matter. And uh, when that window view appeared, we called this method at new window, and we just create a basic hosting controller, which bridges our Swift UI app to the UI kit, and we just add uh, our new window in this method new window that will create a UI kit window. And again, a working example of that is available at the GitHub repo, which you could download uh, right now if you like, if you like to follow along, or later I'll provide a QR code like this one. And uh, with all that said, my top three Swift UI issues were solved successfully for now. Uh, I don't use previews. I found an animation completion block mm, written for Swift UI, and I found a way to work around uh, no multiple windows support. And now to the interesting part, live coding will build uh, this kind of animation. I found it in the Spotify artist app. It's kind of hard to catch because Spotify works mostly great and uh, the network in Armenia is pretty fine too, usually. So yeah, let's build that one and let me switch to Xcode. Uh, I see a question and I will answer this question after the live coding blog, okay? So now, here we have a basic setup of VStack, some spacers. This V spacer is just my simple wrapper about, uh, above, above the spacer, it just sets the height. These filled buttons are just basic 3 buttons with some backgrounds of green and uh, accent color and corner radius. And uh, I also create this model for our dots, just uh, not to spend some additional time, but it's pretty basic setup. We have a state, which we could control from the outside, and we have a dots count, which would be three for this example. And what we need to create is a dots view. So let's do that. We'll create a Swift UI view. Let's call it dots view. Let's get rid of that. And uh, what we need here is a Z stack. As we saw here, we have a backdrop view, rounded rectangle, and three dots. So we could just uh, write something like this. We have a rounded rectangle, and uh, this rounded rectangle should have a color of gray with some opacity to it. And it also should have a fixed frame for now. And let's try to build that. And uh, yeah, we need to insert it in our Z stack. And also in order to check our progress, we need to inject our dots view here, 
with our model. And our model would be an observed object of dots model. It will look like this. And uh, when we create our view here, we should pass the dots model here. And uh, yeah, I, I, as you can see, I don't use previews because I'm not sure if they will work. All right, we have this rounded rectangle of 150 width and height. The other thing we need is our dots view. And uh, these dots would be of for each. This one is uh, just a loop for views. We also need a dot view, not a var func dot view of index will return some view, and here would be our circles with foreground color of white and uh, a frame of let's say sixteen. Now in for each, we need to specify our collection, which we are iterating on. And we have this convenient dots count here. And uh, this ID is a way of SwiftUI to track the diffing uh, of views. But that's, again, a whole another topic on how SwiftUI calculates its layout. Let's try to check if everything is all right. Not quite yet, because we have to add this one. All right, now it looks like mostly like our example. That's OK. Now here, what we want to add is on chain the state previously this state variable. It's marked with this published uh, property wrapper. In, in what, what it does, it just publish uh, the changes when the state changes. And this way, we could observe these changes in our view. And uh, when new value arise, uh, arrives, we could use the switch. We have two cases to start and stop animation, and we will implement it a bit later. Now, the most challenging part would be to create um, a, a, some kind of a geometry effect. So our view could be animated, our dots could be animated. And let's do this by creating a new file scale wave effect, let's call it that. And uh, we have to invert SwiftUI uh, here too. Scale wave effect, and that should be of protocol geometry effect. Uh, this protocol has two constraints. First one is animatable data. We need to provide a setter and getter here. And the main method is the effect value. Uh, in order to control the triggering of our animation, we need to extend our type with additional one. And that's one way to do it. I'm sure there are others. Let's call it trigger will duplicate our animatable data here of type CG <coughs> flow, sorry. And uh, we'll need to have two methods, start and stop. And what we do in these methods, we check if our animatable data is, uh, let's say for now, uh, this value, I'll get to this in a second. 
we should switch it to the positive one. And if not, we switch it to the negative one. This way we could trigger animatable data back and forth uh, when we call our method start. And when we call the stop method, we just reset our animatable data to the initial value. All right. Uh, now we need to mark our methods with mutating because it's a value type and that's fine for us. And we need to pass this trigger here in our geometry effect. So now we have an access to our trigger animatable data. And when we set new value, when SwiftUI sets new value, we should set the value to our trigger. Okay, now we can declare this trigger in our view. And that should be of type scale wave effect. No, uh, not this, trigger, right? And when we switch our state, we call stop and uh, we call with animation, trigger, start. This with animation block tells SwiftUI that uh, we have to trigger our animatable da data with obviously with animation. And it was hard at first, but I cracked this animation, particular animation, um, looking at it as some visual uh, representation. And what's happening here is you can see our dots at first scaling up, then when it reaches the maximum value, second dot begins to scale up and the first dot begins to scale down. And that way we have this kind of wave effect. Now, how you're going to achieve that? I would say with some high school maths. What we could do this, uh, what we could do here is to use our modules. I found it not from the first try, but it will look like what we need. We just have to invert it. We have to then apply our maximum scale and we have to offset it by some value. We'll um, find those, value, those values in a moment. And what we do here is we treat our X axis as our timeline. Uh, which progresses to the right, and our y-axis as our dot scale. So in the initial moment of time, dots first dot starts scaling up, and uh, then it starts to scale down. And what we need here is just to find right coefficients. I kind of found it for you, so you don't have to worry. I just have to remember them and uh, what we also need is a maximum function because we don't want to go below the 1.0 scale it's the initial scale of our view mm. now let's see uh, to visualize that we have to copy that and this parameter here is responsible for our animation offset. And it's definitely should um, depend on our view index because we have three dots and uh, the first dot have the zero index, the second one have uh, first index and the third one have uh, has uh, Two, two, in, uh, two of index, index of two. So let's bring that formula here to preference later, and uh, let's create some variables like slope, like x offset for now, 
it would be zero and some y or y offset. And our formula would look like this. We should have a minus slope of uh, x. Let's move that to the separate method scale x tg float index int and we have to return some value now let's uh, continue with our formula and plus y offset and we'll return the maximum of one or y or y um, okay, so this x offset, as I said, should depend on our index. And uh, the way to do that would be to just, for the sake of this presentation, to subtract some constant, for some index from our constant. And that way, when index is zero, we would have 0 0.5. Uh, when we have uh, index of one, we would have another value. And when the index of two, we would have the needed value as well. We might want to play with those coefficients. Uh, let me see. Now, yeah, uh, that, look, uh, that looks like uh, what we need because here the first dot scaling up and when it reaches the maximum, as you've seen um, in, in the animation video, the, the second dot starts scaling up and the first dot starts scaling down. And that's why we have this minus two to two, two um, timeline. It could easily be rearranged to start from zero, but for the sake of the presentation, let's keep it that way. And now we should change this to one and uh, we should keep our Y offset to 1.5 because that's our maximum scale from this graph. And now we should also convert this index to CG fold because it can subtract. And uh, yeah, we, we got our scale function now. And what we need to return from this method, effect value is a projection transform. Uh, the way to return a projection transform is to use a CG fine transform and to the uh, that's that's a method from core graphics and it just it's just scaling up our uh, our dots in this case and because because uh, we we want our dots scaling in a even manner we should use the animatable data or rather trigger animatable data and the index that we will need to pass to our scale effects. Okay, now we have to pass scale here and here and we can now get rid of that. And then we have to return something from this method. Trigger here. All right, and in order to use our newly created skill wave effect, we need to extend our view with a modifier scale wave. We have to pass an index and we have to pass trigger scale wave effect trigger. Here we could use a extension here 
map the func modifier, and uh, this modifier will accept our newly created scale wave effect with a trigger and an index. All right, and uh, we also need to return the view. And now this scale wave could be applied to our dot view. That's what we need. We have our index and we have our trigger here. And uh, let's see if it's working. Not sure yet. Uh -huh, I see. I see. We have to use Vladimir. Uh, and we have to speed it down a bit. We have to use the repeat forever. Oh, to reverses. Set to false. This way, it won't reverse our animation. And we also made it a bit slower. Now we have one more issue or rather to you see how these dots are scaling up and down, not from the center, but rather from a top edge. And this could be fixed by applying not only the scale transform, but the translation transform. And what we need to pass here is our half of, of a dot frame. In this case, it would be minus eight, uh, but we could easily pass it from the initializer of the scale effect, just for simplicity. Uh, that's a hack because we have to set an anchor point for our scale transform, and there is just no way to do this in SwiftUI. So in order to work around that, we'll need to use offset the same offset but counteract those translations that we made and now we have our anchor point at the center that's it here uh, the one issue that we had we Fixed, and now we have another one. Uh, our animation starts from right to the left, and I wanted it to be <laughs> the opposite way. But uh, let me see. Trigger. Uh, it starts, and it starts from here. We. Uh, we we check if our animatable data is minus 2.0, 2.0, minus 2.0. Um, we could try this uh, trick. All right. <laughs> now with this hack, uh, it's working fine. So uh, I guess we could call it a game here. And uh, yeah, this is coding animations in SwiftUI. So in short, in this uh, 30 or 40 minutes, we get acquainted a bit with SwiftUI, how it's looking like and how it's different from the UI kits. We dive into some common issues and how to solve them. Um, also, we got fairly nice animation in 15 or 20 minutes or so and uh, yeah that would be all i guess and if you want to check the code i'll push uh, my changes to the repository uh, right after the session be available indefinitely and uh, now we have some time for questions and in the meantime you could use the qr code to check the repository. Now Ashish uh, asks, can we access key window in SwiftUI to present notification view? 
uh, a key window could be accessed, but it would be the same window, I guess, uh, that we used in our CPUI code, and or it's uh, kind of deprecated in iOS 13, I guess. So we have to use scene delegates if we target in iOS 13 plus. But uh, overall, yes, we could use the key window. Uh, we could use the key window, but I'm, I'm not sure if it would present uh, the uh, alert as we need. I guess if we present it on our window as itself, because window is, 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 is a UI view sibling, then yeah, we could try that. But this multiple windows uh, setup is really helpful because in banking apps, uh, not only banking apps, we also had a debug menu. And we kind of in need of multiple windows and I'm not sure why it's not there yet. Uh, it's It's been three years, I guess, or four maybe since it's released and uh, there's still no native support for multiple windows. Now, Cherim Shantsev asking, what lessons did you learn developing with SwiftUI? <laughs> I went the hard way and I just found a job which exclusively uses SwiftUI. I uh, also did a quick test task on Tortal, I guess. Uh, it took me a week to build an app. Uh, I used SwiftUI and some modern charts, uh, frameworks, and all that, and that got me going pretty fast. But uh, most of my experience I'm getting now as we be building our app. And uh, Ashish also asking, can we use chain of async events to trigger animation block to scale that size instead? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and as I said, that would be the one way to do that, as I did. And there are other implementations on how to control the animation step. I'm not sure if uh, we use the, I think it would be fine, but uh, mostly I don't see any problems with that. It's just not my implementation here. Oh, you meant synchronous events. That would be tricky because uh, we are on the main thread and we can't use synchronous delays on the main thread, I guess. So um, I saw some wrappers around animations that will use some kind of keyframes and there is also a timeline view, which I didn't explore yet, but there are other options for sure. Now check the chat. Anton says that it's very useful sessions. Session, you're welcome, Anton. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you for registering in this session. And uh, if you don't have any more questions, uh, you could just, uh, if, if you have them in the future, you could just reach out to me on LinkedIn. I also have fairly active GitHub. You could comment here and there. Um, but yeah, my LinkedIn is my main communication channel, I guess. So please use the QR code to my little page with my work experience and all that to contact with me. And thank you all for joining this event. Ashish also asking, what kind of project did I build? Uh, I worked both in FinTech industries and I also worked in the well-being industry. Uh, I built the Weatherwell app uh, from scratch for the 2.0, this one. Uh, and I also worked at this FinTech startup. It's a European one mm, gain a lot of traction and a lot of investments. Yeah, I have Discord. Uh, 
I'm just not sure how to reach to that quickly, but yeah, let me let me try. Oh yeah, of course, it's downloading updates. There's the time. Well, uh, Ashish, you could reach to me on LinkedIn and I will, <laughs> you see, uh, like, it's not very convenient to have a Discord. Uh, please, uh, please add me as your friend and I will give you my Discord, if that's okay to you. Oh, it's loaded, okay. Uh, I'm not a great user of uh, Discord and I don't know, what's, what's, what's my, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, could, could you please, uh, could you please reach out to LinkedIn and I'll, I'll find my username on Discord. All right, uh, any more questions? Ashish, maybe? Oh, Anton, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I missed that one. Um, does the Swift UI ready for production? That's a hard one. Uh, I guess, yes, it's ready. Uh, but that will depend on which iOS version we use. Uh, in a current project, we use iOS 15. And there are still hiccups with uh, versioning because iOS 15 is different from iOS 16 in terms of Swift UI behavior. And we need to be very careful about this. And there are times that you just have no choice but to bridge back to the UI kit. But overall, I guess, yes, it's kind of ready for production from the iOS 15, at least. Ashish, thank you. Thank you for joining me. And thank you all for joining me. Any more questions? Maybe I missed something. Viva, yeah, OM, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Thank you all for joining. And uh, I have some closing, closing question. Closing, I mean, message, yeah. And um, yeah, reach out to my LinkedIn. Um, I'm there uh, pretty pretty often. Yeah, we'll see you. Thank you, Spikey. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, if you want, you could chat a bit here and uh, I will stop my presentation and uh, I will leave you to it. Thank you. Bye all.